Hi, I'm Natasha Sinha, Associate Artistic Director here at Playwrights Horizons, and this is In Process. Today I'm sitting down with Anna K. Jacobs and Michael R. Jackson to discuss the upcoming world premiere of Teeth, a new musical now in rehearsals, just upstairs, and we're starting previews on February 21st. Anna, I feel like you're able to write earworms that are also the most sophisticated thing I've ever heard in music. And Michael, with your like signature wit and honesty and surprise, and then you both collaborated on the book. Each of you on your own write book music lyrics. Can you talk about why you want to collaborate on this project and together what you admire in one another's work and what felt really complimentary about working on this project together? Well, for me, when I encountered the source material and, and sort of was interested in adapting it, it just was clear to me that I didn't have the musical uh, sort of, I didn't have a musical idea about it. Like, and I sort of, if, if, when I'm working on something, if I have like a musical instinct, then I know that I should be doing the music. And I didn't have one on this, and I also mm -hmm. felt like, given what it was about, that it was important that I work with a female collaborator on it to give like a more holistic perspective. Um, and Anna and I, you know, were fans of each other's work. We'd both gone to NYU in separate years, and I was, you know, a big admirer of her work. And she was the first person I thought to approach. Yeah, I, I remember the first time I encountered Michael's work and I was um, like enraptured. It was um, so musical and so funny and so honest. And I think there was something about what Michael was doing that was somewhat ahead of its time as well mm -hmm. um, in just like the level of bravery of the work. And so I just wanted to work with Michael. And so when he approached me with this idea, I, I didn't initially think like, oh yeah, that screams musical. <laughs> but I just was excited to go on a journey with him. And so mm -hmm. I said yes right away. This musical both feels like it's perfect for right now. And I'm just curious if you could talk about like the discoveries you made about that as you, as you continued in developing the piece towards this moment. From my perspective, you know, it's been interesting, like, we've had, like, lots of evolutions in, like, the form mm -hmm. <laughs> of this piece and the sort of tone and the sort of angles that we were coming mm -hmm. at it with. And I, and I think, like, there have been m moments where we had been more explicitly, like, trying to sort of, like, tie it to this time. But the thing that I always say about that, about, like, uh, things being thought of as timely or of the moment mm -hmm. or or uh, you know per, or whatever is that the moment passes mm -hmm. like it's all the moment is always mm -hmm. is continuous and so I think like the more we've gotten to this side of the process for me it's been about trying to make the material live in the sort of American horror uh, musical theater space that's of course in conversation with contemporary culture but also is not so tied to any particular political or cultural mm -hmm. wind um like referring to things but not sort of like attaching the meaning so tightly to those things so for me it's been just about sort of monitoring that mm -hmm. and like and really sort of letting the characters sort of breathe and mm -hmm. live in the in the moments that they're in as opposed to the moment that we're in if that makes any sense mm -hmm. yeah and for me i feel like when we started the musical i was very tuned to the the feminist perspective and at that time it felt like something very new and revolutionary mm -hmm. and that was way back in like 2009 2010 and i think the more that we have worked on it the more heightened my awareness has been around the fact that all different perspectives are impacted by patriarchy. And mm -hmm. so it's more interesting to examine, like, what is that patriarchy? Where does it come from? How does it keep getting handed down from generation to generation? And so I think our line of questioning evolved mm 
-hmm. as we continued working on the piece. Also, just to say, we were so fortunate to be working with Mitchell Lichtenstein, the mm -hmm. screenwriter and director of the film, who um, was so generous with the property and allowed us to take the material in so many directions and um, did not expect us to treat it like it was the Bible. We could do whatever we wanted with it. And um, that made it possible for us to find lots of different connections to the source material depending on mm -hmm where and when we were when we were working on it. Yeah, I'm also just curious, what was fun about figuring out your way into how to adapt it for the stage? The movie is so great, and then you really made this musical your own. Uh, which lenses were you sort of applying to that, and what did you follow? What did you sort of, what did you have to navigate in order to find your way to telling the story? Well, I think the cool thing is we had uh, I think we, our eyes were on different things as we were working through the source material, which I think is what makes us great collaborators on the mm -hmm. piece. Um, for me, the thing that I was taken with was early conversations that I had with Michael about Dawn being like a superheroine and sort of what that journey looks like as she goes from her sort of evangelical, more realistic roots to this like mythic world of Dentata. Mm -hmm. um, and how do I... Um, track that musically and um, I also was really excited about having this community of promise keeper girls who aren't in the film mm -hmm. but are inspired by the scenes where are the these there are these teen evangelical community gatherings mm -hmm. um, and being able to like explore the relationships between the promise keeper girls that was I think really fun for me both like when we were working on the book but also when we were working on the music and I was able to create all these delicious like vocal harmonies for them. Yeah. And for me, you know, my my sort of entry into the source material was just the sort of religious aspect of it. I grew mm -hmm. up, you know, Baptist. Um, I went to church every Sunday for 18 years. I was very involved in the church and I and within that I also was sort of coming out as gay and so there was a lot of conflict between the religion that I was raised in and also the sexuality and that to me was just an ask even though Dawn has a different um, conflict there mm -hmm. it, it felt very similar to to my conflict that I would sort of remembered growing up as a as a young person in church and I was just interested in in how you know, these sort of institutional rules and values can impact something so personal as your sexuality mm -hmm. that sort of so uh, has, is so, ha, is so sort of mysterious and like in something that you want to explore, but the sort of church tells you like not to explore it and we're only to explore it in certain ways and mm -hmm. you can only do it in marriage and all of that. And I just was interested in and what it would be using this weird sort of horror movie uh, premise to like dive into the horror of that. Like, and that to me is what I always think, what I, I like best about horror movies is I think horror is the truth. Like mm -hmm. it's like when the thing that you're afraid of comes true. Mm -hmm. And I feel like this movie, the movie um, really sort of captures an interesting sort of truth Think fear coming to life, and um, and the way and all the the little the points that it hits as it does that was really fascinating to me, and so I wanted to like mm -hmm. sort of pull that apart. Yeah, and the way you're both uh, navigating the tone of this musical and how to sort of keep the people feeling real and like people that we uh, you know that we take seriously, we take like what they care about seriously and what they're going through, even if like the circumstances are are quite wild. Um, and the music that is really defining so much about how we move through the show is so varied and so wide ranging. There, there is like, you know, elements of horror and really, uh, you know, intense foreboding and ominous stuff that's happening in particular songs. And there's sort of Christian pop rock that's just really fun. And you get into the heads of these girls. How did you find the musical voice and how did you sort of layer musical voice alongside the tone of this piece? I think, um, well firstly, the way that Michael and I collaborate on songwriting is very intertwined. Mm -hmm. And before we write a song, we really talk a lot about what we want the moment to accomplish 
and um, what the tone is like and we share examples of songs with each other so it's very much a collaborative effort. Um, I knew when I was thinking about the piece as a whole that like I wanted the score to sort of exist in a binary and move from one end of the scale to the other end of the scale mm -hmm. and so if one end is like this kind of fun infectious Christian pop rock place and the mm -hmm. other end is like crazy mythological Tori Amos meets Igor Stravinsky place <laughs> Um, and one is like guitar driven and one's piano driven. How do we get from A to B and what does that journey look like? And once I sort of had that architecture, it was just about filling the moments in, in partnership with Michael. Um, I, something that's great is we have similar taste in music. So we get excited about the same mm -hmm. musical ideas. Um, and there, there are a lot of songs that have been cut from this musical. Yeah. I think upwards of 32 songs. Um, so at a certain point too, it was like, I understood what type of music and what type of tone I wanted from a moment, but it was about the, sp the specifics of the storytelling in that moment mm -hmm. and how to kind of marry that with the music. Yeah, if there's something that's really interesting about the sort of girl power aspect of the show in that you're, you're not actually dismissing the guys. Like you were saying before, the patriarchy impacts everyone. How did you find who Brad, the, uh, who is Don's brother, and the truth seekers would be in this show? Because that's also an element that's not in the movie, uh, but it feels, very, it feels very whole. It feels like it's speaking to the systems that are at the, at the core of what you're exploring here. Um, and they feel really ex unexpected. You know, There's a way to tell the story that um, would lean into the revenge fantasy side of what could come out of um, what's happening to Dawn, and instead you go so much deeper, um, just not going for that sort of um, low-hanging fruit of, of Dawn and um, only focusing on that, but also making space for what's happening with these guys. How did that come about and what felt important about keeping it? I think, like, we, to be honest, like, it, it became just like a dramaturgical necessity because in order for Dawn's arc to complete, like, her antagonist had to also sort of have a reason, like, a place to go as well. And the more that we, and every, like, draft, like, an early, like all these early drafts, like, we kept running into, like, the same problem mm -hmm. of we would get to their final confrontation and be like, he has no story, uh -huh. like, whatsoever. <laughs> and so it made her whole journey seem kind of pointless. Mm -hmm. And so as we kept going, and, and, I, and there were things to figure out about her journey as well, so I think in a lot of ways that process was necessary for us to sort of clear the way, mm -hmm. like clear things up with her so that we could like figure out how he fit into it. And, and once we like figured out what sort of Brad's point of view was on in, in the story, which uh, sort of similar, you know, to what I was saying earlier about horror coming true, is that like in the story, the horror, he, he witnessed it. Like it is mm -hmm. real, but no one believes him. Right. And also he, is um, sort of treated as a pariah by this sort of patriarchal figure, his mm -hmm. own father, who's a pastor, mm -hmm. who elevates her and sort of denigrates him. Mm -hmm. And like, it just became very clear that we had to sort of like beef up mm -hmm. the fact that both he was telling the truth, but also he was, being, he was then drawn into sort of a corrupt forces mm -hmm. that are uh, manipulating the truth for their own needs. And, and that then intersects with Dawn and the problem with Super Girls in a particular mm -hmm. way as the story begins to really sort of ramp up. Yeah, right. We needed like a strong counterpoint to um, like Dawn had the Promise Keeper girls and for Brad to have a strong counterpoint, we feel like we felt like there needed to be an actual group. So discovering a few years ago that we needed to like build out not just Brad's character, but his community mm -hmm. as that counterpoint was also pretty groundbreaking for us. I also just like reflecting on like the fact that this is an adaptation from film to stage mm -hmm. and if you go back and watch the film, there are so many moments where Brad 
reads as this sort of complex character just through the way that he is shot and you can't do that in a musical mm. you have to come up with story and text to develop the character and so it was a natural process of that adaptation too mm -hmm. yeah it also feels like you know uh there, there's something about making mistakes in this cultural moment that's just not really allowed uh, the way that you're approaching both the PKGs and the Truth Seekers and Don and Brad and what they go through sort of offers room for being able to change yourself, being able to evolve and grow. Um, there's something about the arc of the show that feels like it's uh, really telling that story. Does that feel true? And how do you think about that? Yeah, I mean, to be, to be very honest, like there's something kind of biblical about like their story, um, mm -hmm. which I take a sort of dark pleasure in mm -hmm. um, because they there's like there's like morals within it. There's like um, you know like it's there like there's symbols. There's like all mm -hmm. the things that you would find in like a, like in the Bible or even like like those books like the Scarlet Letter. You know mm -hmm. like th everything means something, and I just think that making it more complicated and more complex for everyone involved is just makes for richer storytelling mm -hmm. um and and i think like this idea of people not being able to make mistakes is is an important one because that's like it's a kind of moralism mm -hmm. that's in our world like that that is at the moment mm -hmm. is that like, we are of a moment that weirdly is almost like they're in the old testament <laughs> and so it feels it makes so much sense to me that like we if we are able to take the story and present the, the story in these terms that weirdly are they're both contemporary and it's old at the same time mm -hmm, mm -hmm. yeah what do you and just to just to switch to what you're working on rehearsals right now this feels like a musical that has always needed a production to fully become itself. What's it been like to work with Sarah Benson, your director, Raja Feather Kelly, your choreographer, and this incredible design and design team and cast who I feel like everything is so rooted in bodies. And so to have everyone in the same room, there's something about rehearsals that feels really special. Um, where, are you, where are you in that process right now? What are you working on maybe today or what's on your mind for tomorrow? Um, yeah, how is that feeling to you to finally be able to work on it fully? Like incredible. Um, I, you know, Sarah is this incredible leader, and she's um, she's so good at communicating what she's visualizing because we have not gotten into the pilot process yet where we're really working with the designers. So she's mm -hmm. having to share a lot of that information with us verbally, but she's great at that. Um, for me, as the music person on this process, working with Raja has been like groundbreaking mm -hmm. because as you said, it's about bodies. And um, I feel like Raja is so musical and also so versed in the type of music of this show mm -hmm. that I feel like the, the music and dance are sort of becoming one and the same thing now mm -hmm. as we continue in rehearsal mm -hmm. with Raja. Um, so that's been, really pleasurable for me um, and um, I have been allowed to go into the costume shop because <laughs> I care deeply about costumes and <laughs> being able to see what Enver is cooking up has been really fun for me I mean it's just fun is the headline it's just been really really fun yeah um, and I'm so excited for when we get to the part of the process where we have things like blood and fire <laughs> and ash and water. <laughs> water and yeah but I, I don't know I'm still like semi in a state of denial because we have been <laughs> developing this work for over 10 years behind music stands right right and now it finally becomes its 3d version of itself its full version I feel like previews are always my favorite part of working on a new show because it's really when all the elements are genuinely there. You know, you can workshop things to death. Many things are sometimes. Right. I'm so happy that this one gets to like take its full life and is, like especially your score, Anna. I mean, which is absolutely incredible. I mean, it's been in my head for the past decade <laughs> constantly. <laughs> uh, it has not left, and it's so specific in its storytelling. It's doing that defining work. It's not just 
like an air around the text. It's also telling story. Mm -hmm. um, and so, you know, when we get to like sits pro bland, when we get to, you know, have the cast and the, and the orchestra there, the band there, to be able to hear it all, I feel like it'll suddenly become itself fully in a way that, you know, you just, you can't get to until you're on the stage itself. We're on yeah. a different stage right now, but soon we'll be <laughs> downstairs on your stage. I think um, also because mm -hmm. this show leans on horror and comedy yeah. specifically, the audience is part of the show. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. The mm -hmm. show will not be the show until we have a live audience. Totally. So I'm so excited for the first preview to see what that's like. Yeah. Same. Yeah. And both of you are actually returning to Playwrights Horizons in different ways. <laughs> Anna, you were in our musical theatre department years ago as a fellow. Um, what's it like to work on your own show now since that was sort of your experience of playwrights before was being on staff and working on other people's shows? Yeah, <laughs> it's really humbling. I think I when I was an intern in 2008, I was here because like, I just wanted to be part of a theatre ecosystem and to learn from other people who were immersed in that world. I didn't have any specific expectations for myself as a creator. Um, and and I, I'm also from Australia, so I didn't, you know, I just didn't even know what my life would look like 10 years from then. Mm -hmm. um, and to be back here putting my own work on the stage is just, it blows my mind. Yeah. And Michael, you were here before the pandemic with a strange loop. Um, yes. And since then, you know, Broadway, Pulitzer's, Tony's, all sorts of things. But what's it like to be here again with a different show? that functions very differently, behaves very differently, um, but at the same theater after having all those other experiences? It's, it feels really nice because, you know, I, it's like a, I have a theatrical home and it's great to sort of to come back. I had such a beautiful time working on A Strange Loop here that to be able to sort of come back with a different project and be just as supported by the incredible team um, here is it feels really good and like and I hope to make many shows at Playwrights Horizons. We hope so too. And is there something um, about Teeth that you really feel like you want to say that people won't expect about it? Is there something that feels like it sort of works against what people might be thinking the show is? Um, I guess for me, like I think like it's easy to sort of like look at the premise of it of the show and just sort of think that it's gonna be a kind of one dimensional kind of feminist revenge tale, and that's like th there's an aspect of that mm -hmm. within it, but it it is I think a piece that is sort of trying to grapple with deeper issues and with like. Um, with questions about morality and and choice and consent and freedom of one's own bodily autonomy for for men for women for everyone who has a sexuality and that to me is a really beautiful and exciting thing to grapple with that I think that many people have grappled with but never there's not a lot of voice given to it mm -hmm. and so I'm hoping that people come with a really open mind and are, and are open to the surprise of it not just being one level, that there's like mm -hmm. multiple layers mm -hmm. um, that they can experience a show at. Yeah. What about you, Anna? I was sort of going to say the same thing. I was going <laughs> to say be prepared to not be told what to think. Mm -hmm. um, I think something we're excited that we're doing is we're asking a lot of questions and we're not necessarily um, delivering all of the answers in a in a clean way. Yeah, I mean, it's something I, that's really important to me that I've been thinking about beyond teeth, but in theater in general, is that like, you know, we're living in a world that is like quite obsessed with content. Mm -hmm. Content, 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 content. <laughs> and I'm someone, and I know Anna as well, who's like very much interested in form. Mm -hmm. And, and bringing, and form, and, and it's when you bring form and content together is when you have art. And that, for me, is what I really want people to, like, understand that they're walking into. This is not, this is not like something you're scrolling through on Instagram. Mm -hmm. It's like a real story with meat on its bones that, um, that as Anna said, is not going to tell you what to think, but it's going to be kind of bivalent and, um, 
and not in a strict binary uh, of mm -hmm. its ideas. So I, I'm excited for people to sort of to wrestle with that. It's a big reason why we were excited about it at Playwrights. It really feels like a full gesture, again, with all its elements. Musical theater has so many different storytelling elements sort of all layered on top of one another, and they're so interwoven in this one in like such an intentional way that we're so proud to be doing it. Um, and thank you for taking your time out of your lunch hour when you're so busy doing a million different things. Um, but this is really exciting to talk to you about, and I can't wait till we're on stage. Thanks, Natasha. Thank you. <laughs> thank you.